Before we go on to this last chapter of Volume 1 of Everdark, I want to recognize everyone who has made this production possible, starting with the superb voice talent of her Grace Reed studio. After working together with the cast for many episodes, I don't only know them as actors, but also as fascinating people and friends. It has been a fantastic experience to have them bring the characters and the world of Everdark to life with their abilities. And this is only the beginning. I look forward to sharing this chapter and many more with you. Last time on Everdark, Balthazar made a compelling case that he should become Julian's master instead of Damon. But will Damon allow that? Everdark, Episode 15 Whoever Shall Drink of My Blood Julian picked up one of the bags of blood and turned it this way and that, watching as the red liquid oozed around inside. His stomach clenched again and there was this terrible burning sensation in the pit of it. In response, he jerked forward, curling in on himself. So am I hungry or dying? In the silence after his thought, he listened. He listened for Damon and heard nothing. Are you there? Are you just cutting me off, or are we separated because I'm too drained to reach you? I'm not dead, Damon. I need you to answer me. I need to know what to do. His stomach finally released, and he was able to sink back against the pillows. He had to eat something, and the bag blood would have to do. Though he had acted casually about it with Christian, he didn't want to make his best friend any tenser than he already was. His heart lurched at the thought of drinking from anyone else but Damon. He ground his teeth at that. There was nothing between him and Damon. He was pretty sure that the Vampire King had cut off the connection between them, assuming he'd died. So he owed the man nothing. He could feed from whom he liked. Balthazar actually wanted him. It would make things easier for him and Christian to make their new lives together if they were with one master. Christian's right. That word sucks. He examined the blood bag. There were two spigots at the top of the bag. He assumed that was how the blood was put into the bag in the first place. He opened one up and sniffed experimentally. His nose wrinkled. He could smell the coppery scent of blood, but also the antiseptic scent of the bag. His stomach clenched again, not as badly as before, but still painfully enough to make up his mind. Though the blood didn't smell terribly appetizing, he didn't care. Having something in his stomach would help. He lifted the bag to his mouth and fastened his lips on the spigot. Bottoms up. He drank down a large swallow of blood. He felt the cool liquid sliding down his throat. There was none of the pleasure he'd had from drinking from Damon that one time. There were no shared visions of the person that this blood had come from. There was no heartbeat. There was no one to gently touch his hair. He brought the bag down almost immediately. For as soon as the blood hit his stomach, he began to retch. It was wrong. All wrong. The blood felt dead to him. He hunched over and gagged. Bright red spattered the bedsheets like a bad tie-dye job. Some small part of him was darkly amused that the blood didn't look real at all. If he'd seen this scene in a horror movie, he would have told Christian that it looked fake. Almost immediately, the door to the bedroom was thrown open and Balthazar and Christian piled into the room. Humiliation surged through him. Julian tried to apologize for messing up the bed, but Balthazar waved him off. Let's get you some water, Julian. Christian, please remove those dirty bedclothes from him while I get the water. Just throw the bloody things out into the hallway. They'll be picked up and taken care of later, Balthazar said with a brusqueness that implied throwing up blood everywhere was no big deal. But what if it is? What if I'm dying? Again? Why can't I drink blood? And as panic raced through him on spider legs, he called for the Vampire King without thought. Damon, are you there? I need you to talk to me. Silence. Julian squeezed his eyes tightly shut. If Damon was ignoring him, he could go fuck himself. Julian didn't care about him then. He could do this on his own. Except the pit that opened in his stomach told a different story. But Julian forced himself to remain calm and open his eyes. 
His fists were clenched on top of his knees as he tried to steady his roiling stomach. He was still so hungry, but he felt so sick. Christian quickly stripped the bed, while Balthazar came out of the bathroom with a wet towel in one hand and a glass of water in the other. Lord Ravenscroft sat on the edge of the bed. He efficiently wiped the blood from Julian's face and urged him to take a drink of water and spit it up in said towel. He expressed no distaste for holding a towel full of Julian's spit-up. Thank you. Julian got out. His voice sounded phlegmy, and he hacked up more thick blood into the towel. Julian was amazed and grateful how unfazed the vampire lord was. Maybe Balthazar was so used to blood that it didn't sicken him to see bedclothes splashed with crimson. But vomited blood was different from fresh blood. Julian gulped down the water and let Balthazar clean him up. The vampire lord was rubbing his back gently. It's all right, Julian. Just breathe, Balthazar murmured. Christian, who had taken the bedclothes out into the hall, returned. His face was white with worry. What happened? Why couldn't he keep the blood down? It's not unusual, and it's nothing to be worried about. I know it looks very dramatic, but it isn't. Young vampires have a hard time digesting bagged blood. As I've explained, they usually nurse from their masters for quite some time. Balthazar twisted around and extended the soiled towel to Christian. Could you take this and get me a clean one? That's a good lad. Christian didn't hesitate any more than Balthazar had. Julian cringed at the mess he'd made, and the fact that others were cleaning it and him up. He struggled to sit up. I should help, Julian said. No, you need to keep still. Balthazar easily pushed him gently back down onto the pillows. Julian's eyes flickered to where Christian had disappeared into the bathroom. Then he quickly looked back at Balthazar. He grasped the vampire's biceps and held them, clutched them really. He cast his voice low. I need you to be honest with me. A hundred percent. He squeezed Balthazar's arms. Is this really normal? Balthazar's eyebrows had risen from the desperation in his grip. But at these words, his confusion seemed to clear. It is. Why? Damon said that every fledgling he'd ever had has died. I need to know if this is a sign of that. Julian insisted. A flash of anger crossed Balthazar's handsome face. He told you that you wouldn't survive, but he turned you anyways. It was the only way. I gave him my blood so he could get out of the tomb and save Christian from those other vampires. He was too weak otherwise. Julian quickly explained. But then I needed strength to get Christian out of the Everdark, so he gave me his. And you took his blood believing this? Balthazar's expression was strangely blank. Yes, of course. I had to save Christian. There's no life for me without him, Julian said. You are extraordinarily brave and selfless to do such a thing, Balthazar finally said. He looked so fondly at Julian that it almost made Julian uncomfortable. I don't think it was. Bravery is something you do when you have something on the line. Like I said, without Christian, I wouldn't want to go on anyways. Julian muttered and looked away from the vampire lord. After another long moment, Balthazar replied, In the stories, supposedly, King Damon could not make fledglings. But I don't think this vampire who turned you is him. Julian frowned. He looked up. Why not? Because people... Even vampires, or perhaps especially vampires, need a history. We need our kings and queens and gods. We need these things to give order and meaning, Balthazar explained, his gaze going distant. We often need them because they excuse the bad things we do. Believe me, many masters have used tales of him to do many things. Damon is real, and he's not bad, Julian added. He didn't know why he was defending the vampire king. He'd abandoned Julian, hadn't he? Again. He did the best he could for me. I knew the risks and I accepted them. I don't need someone to hold my hand in life. A smile bloomed on Balthazar's face. No, you don't. I've seen your videos, and you are brave and strong and forging your own path. That's why, among other reasons, I want you in my house. You're not dying, Julian. Well, you already did. This stuff with the blood- What are his options? Christian asked as he emerged at that moment, not only with dry and wet, clean towels, but some different clothes. 
drawstring pants and a Henley in a deep blue for him to change into. His best friend placed the clothes at the bottom of the bed and handed the towels to Balthazar. The fact that he was trusting Balthazar to do this told Julian that somewhere, perhaps deep down, Christian believed that Balthazar was acting in their best interests. All right, Balthazar said, businesslike, as he went to clean Julian's chin. Julian took the towel from him. I feel like a baby who spit up with you doing that. Just tell me if I get it all. Balthazar surrendered the wet towel and held the dry one for him. Here are the options that I see. Bagged blood? Yeah, I'm not doing that again. Julian's stomach threatened mutiny just thinking about it. He wiped his face harder to get his mind off of it. The towel rasped against his beard. It was strange to think that though he was dead, his hair was still growing. Then that's out, Balthazar agreed. Couldn't he be hooked up to an IV? Elena is, Christian pointed out. Do you want your best friend to have to be hooked up to an IV the rest of his existence? Balthazar didn't even pause for that answer. No, you must learn to feed. But what about feeding from a live human? I assume you must have people around for this, Julian said. You are correct. It would be a pain to hunt constantly. We would do nothing else. But while that will become an option for you later on, it's not now. You'll have the same reaction to the bagged blood, maybe worse, Balthazar said. Can I feed him? Christian asked. His left hand reached and rubbed his right wrist as if imagining Julian drinking from him. Julian swallowed. He would be safe with Christian, but that should not be their role to each other. He didn't want to be dependent on his best friend to eat. That would put untold strain on them both, even if Christian would never turn him away. Especially since Christian won't. Before Balthazar could object, Julian said, Thank you so much, Christian, but no, I, I don't want you to bear that burden. Julian, I, I know you would give of yourself willingly, but no, thank you, but no. Julian told him as gently as he could. Christian just nodded and said nothing. Julian turned to Balthazar. So it's Damon's blood or yours. Those are really the only options I have, aren't they? Balthazar tipped his head without saying anything. They were back to the same spot they'd been before all of this had happened. Balthazar had cut to the chase the first time they'd spoken. Julian hadn't really been accepting of that completely when the vampire lord had said it. But he knew now that this was truly his only choice. Damon! Damon! Where are you? Do you... Do you give a damn? Something in Julian shriveled when there was no response. Balthazar took the wet towel from him and handed him the dry one. Julian hadn't realized he'd stopped moving. Quickly, he dried his face. How long can Julian go without blood? Christian's expression was strained. He knew that Julian was having trouble with his choice, even though it should have been a no-brainer. Balthazar was here and clearly wanted him. Choice made except his heart lurched at the thought. He hasn't eaten yet on his own since he was turned, and he needs to within the next few hours or he risks going feral, Balthazar explained. Julian could hear the capitalization of the word feral. Even without an explanation for what it was exactly, he could guess. He would go mad with hunger and become a truly base animal. He would attack people. He could not allow that to happen. This wasn't just about him and his feelings, it was about safety and sanity. Not only would he be putting other people at risk, he could only imagine the horror that Christian would go through if he were to become feral. It was simply not an option. Christian stood at the bottom of the bed, studying Julian intently while his hands worried a small piece of string, likely from the sheets. Balthazar, maybe you can leave Julian and me to discuss- No. Julian cut him off. There's really nothing to discuss. I haven't heard from Damon, and I don't have the strength to go to Night Valen myself and beg him to help me. I don't even know if he would if I asked. That hurt immeasurably to say, but it was true. Balthazar coughed slightly. I had a member of the house go to the library entrance. It appears locked. Julian felt his heart ice over. Then it's settled. Balthazar lowered his eyes, giving Julian privacy, even though he didn't move away physically. Julian was grateful for it. It's okay, Julian said more to himself than to them. Damon helped me when I needed it. He owes me nothing more. He owes you. Balthazar shook his head. 
so much more than you know. But I understand that we should leave it. You've made your choice. There are many people who work full-time behind the scenes to produce Everdark. A quality production requires a full staff that includes both the talent and the production crew. Without the production team, the show would definitely not go on nearly as well. With a production manager, a voice editor, a podcast editor, a proofer, an illustrator, a graphic designer, tech support, and a channel manager, and I'm out of breath just reading all of that, Everdark is able to be a smooth, polished experience. Without them, there would be no artwork, thumbnails, music, or the editing that makes for effortless listening. So let's say a word of thanks to the crew behind the scenes. I certainly am. Thank you so much, guys. A choice? Damon made it for me. Julian took in a deep breath and turned his gaze fully to Balthazar. Have you ever done this before? Fed another master's fledglings? Yes. There was a mirthless smile that crossed his face. There's something you must know. My master was a bastard. He starved us, beat us, made us his slaves, and I killed him for it. Balthazar's gaze went distant, and Julian could read in it that there was much more horror in those bleak statements than he could ever imagine. I pledged that I would never be like him. Christian had gone very still at the end of the bed. He was regarding Balthazar with a slightly stunned expression. This information had changed his view as to the vampire lord, at least slightly. Julian hesitantly put a hand over one of Balthazar's. I'm... I'm so sorry. That mirthless smile appeared again. What I did was necessary, but I can tell you that it was still hard. I still mourned for the master I wished I'd had. Julian blinked as his eyes suddenly burned. Maybe he wasn't the only one who wished for something different. Damon hadn't hurt him like Balthazar had been by his master. The vampire lord looked steadily into Julian's eyes. He put his hand lightly over Julian's as he said, So I know a little of what you're feeling. I know that choosing me is not easy. But I promise that I will give the two of you the best existence I can. He twisted around to look at Christian, whose head was lowered. His best friend seemed fascinated by the string in his hand. I know this wasn't really your choice. Becoming vampires. Everything. But it is done, Christian said, though he did not lift his head. We must get used to it. I want far more for you than that. I want you to be happy. Balthazar insisted, and Julian could hear the truth in his voice. He turned back to Julian. There were young vampires in the house who came with me into exile. I fed them. They are fine. Christian is the first person I have turned fully. He gave a genuine soft smile then, and Julian saw a shy pride in it almost. His hands squeezed Julian's. But all in my house are under my care. Julian swallowed. So much had happened in the last twenty-four hours. He felt hollowed out by it and more uncertain of his own life's course than he'd ever been. But Balthazar was offering him a port in this storm. He would take it. So, how do we do this? Julian forced his voice to sound light. In the vampire movies I've seen, they go right for the throat after saying they don't drink wine. But I sense that might not be the right way to go here. Balthazar chuckled indulgently and looked up at Julian through his lashes. He was truly good-looking, one of those people whom were effortlessly sensual. Julian's heart beat harder as he thought of being so close to this vampire. You could feed from me that way, but it might be too intimate yet. He made the last into a question, even as his silver eyes sparkled with knowledge that it would. Yet he still hoped that Julian would be brave enough to do it. Julian found himself blushing hotly and looked away. Maybe we'll save the throat-biting for another day. Indeed. Balthazar looked towards Christian. I think I would like to feed you both at the same time. Julian and Christian's gazes met. Julian remembered Christian's suppositions about Balthazar wanting twins, or in this case, 
best friends as a fantasy. He let out a choked laugh, which had Balthazar looking at him oddly. <laughs> it's nothing. Julian lied and bit his inner cheek to stop any more nervous laughter from spilling out. Why do you want to feed us both together? Christian crossed his arms over his chest. Do you think he'll admit to wanting a threesome? Oh, Christian, Balthazar is a seducer. He won't say that outright. Because I think you will find that you will want to feed as soon as Julian starts. It's easier if we plan for that in the beginning, Balthazar shrugged. And I thought it would make you both more comfortable to be doing this, well, together. Christian regarded Lord Ravenscroft for long moments without blinking, but then he nodded brusquely and sat down on the bed on the other side of Balthazar from Julian. I take it we'll be drinking from your wrists, as the throat is out of the question? You are correct. Balthazar pushed up the sleeves of his soft cashmere sweater to reveal slender, elegant wrists. He offered one to Christian. His best friend took it and held Balthazar's hand lightly. It was fascinating to see how Balthazar's pupils swelled when Christian touched him. He is really into Christian. It's not a new thing, I don't think. He was watching us. How long has he been a Christian fanboy, I wonder? Feeling better, knowing that even vampires could crush on his best friend, Julian took the other proffered wrist. Balthazar's skin was warm, and his hand was well formed. Julian remembered when he had drunk from Damon's wrist. His stomach trembled, but this time in anticipation. This blood would taste different from Damon's, but thankfully nothing like what was in the bag. It would be satisfying. When he saw Christian bring Balthazar's wrist to his plush mouth, Julian did the same. Balthazar's fingers curled along their jaws, encouraging them. He smelled of cinnamon and clove, sweet and spicy. Julian realized he would smell more of Balthazar's cologne if he was placing his lips on the vampire lord's throat. His fangs were suddenly extended, and he was shaking slightly. Julian found his eyes going unfocused, and that he was imagining Damon's noble profile instead of Balthazar's. If I just don't think about it, maybe it'll seem like I'm drinking from Damon. He shook himself internally. That wasn't fair to Balthazar. This man was feeding and sheltering him and Christian. He needed to acknowledge that. We won't hurt you by doing this, will we? There are tendons and veins and such here. Christian frowned as he thought of what could go wrong. You just have to sink your fangs in gently. The blood will flow and you will drink it down. There is no need to gnaw. Balthazar grinned. All right. Christian's eyes met his. Ready, Julian? Want to count to three? Julian joked. Christian, though, took it seriously. One. Two. Balthazar whispered, his eyelids hooded clearly with the thought of the upcoming pleasure. Three. Oh my god! Julian's voice rose up in a shout of utter shock. What? Julian, Christian, get out of here! Balthazar roared as he saw what Julian had. The wall opposite the bed had become glass. It was no longer plaster, paint, wood, and steel. It was glass, clear as spun sugar, and beyond it wasn't dirt, but a city. A city of pale stone. Night, Varlin. There was a stone street under the two moons, and running down it straight towards them were hundreds of white wolves the size of cattle. White wolves with red glowing eyes. The glass would not hold against this onslaught. They would be through it in seconds. Balthazar half-lifted Julian and Christian from the bed, trying to get them out of the way of danger, but not even vampire speed was enough. The glass shattered, and the wolves streamed in like a raging flood. They were on top of the three of them in seconds. Julian heard Balthazar snarling. Wolves went flying as the vampire lord fought against them valiantly, but vainly. As if pushed along by the current, Balthazar was suddenly up against the wall by the door, wolves at his throat, while Julian and Christian were still stunned on the bed. Then the wolves melded into one figure, a figure dressed in stark black and white, tall and commanding. It was Damon, the Vampire King, in his leather pants, boots, and silk shirt with a fur coat, the same color as the wolf's fur draped from his shoulders. He was holding Balthazar by the neck with one hand. The vampire lord's heels beat against the wall. Damon held him two feet off the floor with ease. 
The vampire lord was spitting and hissing. Julian saw the fear in his eyes, though, even as he valiantly fought against the unstoppable force that was Damon. Julian knew what was going to come next. He'd seen Damon do it twice already. Julian was up off the bed and flinging himself at Damon. He gripped the arm that held Balthazar. No! Julian shouted. Don't hurt him! Balthazar is not an enemy! Damon, stop! Damon's voice, in his mind somehow blessedly again, said, he tried to take you from me. He will answer for this betrayal. Damon, he's not a traitor to you. If anyone is a traitor, it's me. Julian cried. Those red eyes, like blood-red jewels, flickered over to him for a moment. Never. You would not betray me. I was... I, I was starving, and, and I thought... Julian's throat tightened to the point he almost couldn't speak. I thought you didn't want me. I thought you abandoned me when I couldn't hear you any longer. Those red eyes grew wide. They were wild, and Julian could tell that Damon was on the knife's edge of losing control. No, I never left you. You, you could not hear me. I was too damned weak to reconnect you fully when you went into siren territory. I could hear you, but you could not hear me. Balthazar took that unfortunate moment to try and lunge forward and dislodge the hand that held him. That was a mistake, as Damon easily held on to him like he was an unruly kitten. Don't fight, Balthazar. He'll kill you as easy as breathing. Julian cautioned him. Tell the child behind me to put down the lamp. Otherwise I will have to punish him for attempting to hit his king, Damon said. Julian realized that Christian had crept over to the nightstand and grabbed one of the heavy lamps. He had been about to bash Damon over the head with it. Julian shook his head rapidly at his best friend. Christian, he knows what you're doing. It won't work anyways. Just put the lamp down and everything will be okay, Julian said. Christian let out a growl, but he lowered the lamp, though did not put it down. I will still be killing this one for daring to touch what is mine. Damon shook Balthazar rather like Julian could have done to a small dog. No, you will not. Julian emphasized each word, which had Damon's eyebrows rising. The Vampire King was clearly not used to being told what he could and could not do. Julian was sure this was just the first time there would be a battle of wills between them. Balthazar saved Christian, and he saved me. When you couldn't be there, he was. Damon's red gaze slid to Balthazar, who looked a bit purple and was gasping. Did saving you include trying to steal you from me? Like I said, that was my choice when we... we lost our connection. Julian firmed his shoulders. And I might add that you never thought I was going to survive your blood. You retreated from me before, so why do you care now? You are mine, Damon growled. <laughs> You're going to have to do better than that. I'm my own, Julian insisted, but seeing that this was not the time to discuss Damon's evident possessive nature, he continued, But regardless, we all thought you wanted nothing to do with me, and he didn't pressure me, he just gave me options, and I've... I chose. Damon's nostrils flared, and his eyes narrowed. Would you choose him now, over me? Julian did not hesitate as he answered, Of course not. I mean... I'm so gratefully offered, but you, you are the one. Well, anyways, I, I would choose you. I, I do choose you. I see. Damon sounded slightly mollified. We will be discussing this further, Julian. The Vampire King released his hold, and Balthazar slid to the ground, clutching at his throat and coughing. Christian went to his side immediately and examined his throat. It's, mm, it's nothing. Balthazar croaked out, which clearly showed it very much was something. I'm... I'm fine, Christian. At that moment the door to Balthazar's bedroom crashed open, and Arceus burst into the room. He was wielding an axe in one hand. His face was red with rage. Behind him was a much smaller figure. It was Sophia Strange. Damon regarded the axe-wielding berserker and the little teenager with the same level of concern, which meant none. Arceus, d don't Balthazar gasped, extending one hand towards his friend. But he needn't have worried. 
For the moment that Arceus saw Damon, he stopped. The axe dropped from his suddenly limp hands. He didn't blink, and then his legs seemed to go out from under him, and he was on his knees before Damon. My king, Arceus said tremulously. Damon inclined his head as if that was his due. Julian was tempted to hit him, but didn't. Things were a little calmer. He wanted them to stay that way. Sophia Strange picked her way into the room, hands behind her back, doing a sort of skipping walk. She curtsied low to Damon and said, My king, it is so good to finally have you awaken with us. Before Damon could respond, she said to Julian, You better catch him, dear one. Breaking through the earth from the Everdark has taken more out of him than he realizes. He wasn't really ready to come here. He's gonna feel it right now. At her final word, Damon was suddenly collapsing towards the ground. Damon! Julian cried. He had a second to grab Damon and ease the vampire king to the floor. Arceus was immediately at Damon's other side, supporting him as well. Why did you come to Earth when you weren't ready? Julian found himself asking in a high, aggrieved voice as he stared into the suddenly bloodless face of the vampire king. Worry writhed through him. One of Damon's hands. Trembling and pale, reached up and brushed Julian's cheek, a bare brush of fingertips. For you. I came. For you. And then Damon's head fell forward as unconsciousness dragged the Vampire King into darkness. Join us next time for Episode 16, Awkward Moments. You may think I've mentioned the entire cast and crew of Everdark, but that isn't the case. There are actually thousands of people who have helped to create this production. Those thousands are our paying supporters, Wraith Rain members, past and present, Amazon customers who have bought my books and audiobooks over the years, Wraith Rain shop customers who have bought books, audiobooks, manga, and merch, and the YouTube channel supporters who have memberships or give us super chats and stickers during streams. If you've ever given us money, you have given us the ultimate resource, the thing that anyone needs to create and publish anything. Without this money, we could have all the good ideas in the world, but we wouldn't be able to make any of them real. So thank you for your past and present support. You are the ones who have helped us create more and more works of gay romantic action adventure stories in various forms. See you next time for Chapter 16. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thelis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart, and Liz Gentle as Seer. Edited by Matthew Prince. Continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reads Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.